On this installment of Creative Cabin Fever, we have a part two with Paul Bulger. We didn't get to cover everything because he is frightfully the most interesting man that exists in the Waterford. There's just too much to cover. I got a bit nervous. Loads of people said they didn't ner- notice me getting nervous and not being able to do the content, but I know that's what happened. So we're doing round two when I've really prepared my questions and I've taken the time to actually go through what we're going to do. And I'm very interested. But the first thing I want to talk about is obviously Amy Montgomery released a single yesterday and you did the artwork for that. And I love that there's a crossover in my interviews between two people that I really, really admire artistically. So how did that come about? Well, I, the guys who made, I made the album with that I just put out a while ago, the uh, Wolf Island team, they, Chris Brown and all those guys, they played, Amy played with them because her, her drummer and her partner and her producer is Michael Marmika, who used to play with, Melosian, I think, and a few other bands. He was a singer in his own band, I think. And they played together in Germany. And then they, they came over here, oh, it must be going two years ago now. Yeah, it would be. And they did a small tour of Ireland, and Amy was support. Uh, they did a kind of an ensemble thing where they had four or five uh, Wolf Island artists. This was before I did anything with them. And I just went along as a fan and a, and a friend. I, I got to know those guys over the years. And uh, through, uh, actually through Gary Kehoe, who uh, runs Roller Coaster Records. Uh, long story short, anyway, Amy was supporting them, and um, I, they came back then for another spin around Ireland, and it just so happened that I'd been over in Canada, and I was doing my record, and then we needed drums, obviously, but we kind of did it arse backwards. We we did we put the drums on last, actually, or maybe my, my, my singing went on last, but the, so we did the drums with Michael, and I got to know Amy, like they all knew each other. So I went up to where they lived in Belfast, or the previous studio they had, and, and we hung out a little bit. And uh, we should have got on like a house on fire. She's a great crack, and she's really good, you know, and brilliant at what she does. And Michael's a lovely fella; he's brilliant as well. And then um, about a, maybe a month or six weeks ago, she rang me up and she said, uh, "Look, I'm putting out a single, and I love some of your drawings. I've, I've been looking at them, you know, and all the rest of it." And, and I was going, "Okay." She said, "Will you do? Would you have time to do a cover for me?" And I went, "Yeah, of course." What, what do you need? And she had a, a kind of a clear idea, color-wise, what she wanted, and she wanted to kind of reflect the song and all the rest of it. Uh, and I, I we, we did a bit of back and forth. We, in fairness to her, she it was, it was the two of us did it really. I mean, it's my drawing and I put it together, but it's her concept. And but the sketch is an old sketch that I had. It's not one that was done for that, for especially for the uh, cover. It was ba- I did the Inktober thing, which happens every year in October. People all over the world, you know, do ink drawings based on a certain theme and I did Irish mythology and I happened to have a drawing lying around of a goddess and I, I she's a pre-Christian goddess called Boan the Boyne. Uh she was the one who was supposed to create the Boyne and I showed it to Amy and I said look this has something what do you think and she went oh that's perfect so then we uh she gave me the butterflies and we we just constructed that whole thing sitting here like I'm talking to you and and we just batted back and forth and then I, I played around with it and um I think I finished it a few weeks ago I can't remember when I did it. I've I've done more for her since we we've done. She has. Oh, I probably shouldn't tell you. <laughs> anyway, she she has more coming up that I've done for her. But it's not drawings. It's it's using material she has. Okay, no, that's amazing. Yeah, in my interview that I had with her, she was talking to me about well, like how she makes her own uh, mm. frames and CDs and stuff. And I just thought that's so fascinating. Like when I met her first, it was like I said, she was playing the gig and she did a brilliant version of a Led Zeppelin song and uh, trampled underfoot. And it caught my, you know, Led Zeppelin are one of my favorite bands. So I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a really cool version, funky. It, and she did her take on it. It was brilliant. And we bought CDs off her. And yeah, they were kind of hand painted, you know, covers. And they were brilliant. Yeah, they're cool. They're like splash, splattery stuff. Stuff I used to do myself years ago. Everybody's kind of done it. But she has a, she has a flavor to it that is definitely her own. You know? Yeah, I know. The, the, the way her name is written on the cover, uh, I think a friend of hers did that. He just hand He has a lovely handwriting. So he wrote, so we use his writing which is a nice touch, I thought. That so is that people involved, you know, and and uh, they, you know, they were clear on what they wanted as well. Like her manager, they they wanted a specific vibe, and I had my own suggestions about creating a kind of a, I hate to use the word brand, but a kind of a image, a kind of a cohesive visual language, you know. So yeah, it was good. So that that's how that came about, and and I know Amy pretty pretty well, and I'm going to get her to sing on one away thing someday. <laughs> Oh, we'll see. Yeah, no, Intangible. I really enjoyed it when it came out on Friday because yeah. 
Friday is what I do first thing in the morning, Paul, is I get up at seven, I go to the park and I put on the release radar and I pick my favorite songs from that week and I make a playlist and then I contact whoever I like and I'm like, I really like your song. Can we do a thing? <laughs> Very good. So yeah, I listened to it first thing Friday morning and I was like... It's a nice, stinky kind of a song and the message is nice in it. And she's, I like her lyrics. She's very, she's very good. With her. She has a way of saying, she has a nice turn of phrase. She's, she's got a really poetic way yeah, of yeah. lyricizing. Yeah, yeah, she's, you know, she gets it. It's cool. Yeah, it's amazing. You obviously are no stranger to mixing art and music, obviously with your own CD, which you can show everyone. You made the beautiful case. Yeah. And the artwork. It's amazing. shiny because I didn't take the plastic off of this one, but okay. can you see it? It's beautiful, yeah. And I own it, but I don't have it on me right now. So I, I was, was like, trying to find a painting for you earlier, and I don't know where I put it because I had, like I, I sent you, I had to take it off. The I couldn't when I scanned it for this. The painting's about fourteen inches by about twelve or something. It's not that big, but it's um, I couldn't scan it because of the bloody frame the thing it was on, you know. So I took off the canvas and I put it. It's here somewhere. I don't know where it is. Um, yeah. But uh, that's, that's got a, a funny story. Did I ever tell you how this came yeah. out? Yeah, I was, before I moved back to Ireland, I used to travel a lot with um, the platoon business stuff, you know, and I kind of cut it out for a few years, but I, I tell you how mad it was. I went to Australia one time for the day, two days to get there, a meeting and came back. So it was a week in my life in the air. It was insane. But that's not, yeah. And one of those crazy trips, uh, I had jet lag and I couldn't sleep. So I came out here and um, it, it actually was, we had moved back. So I must have been still doing a bit of traveling. And I, I couldn't sleep. It was three or four o'clock in the morning. And I started just messing around with the paints. It was kind of tidying up. You know, when you can't sleep, you're just doing stuff. And then I found um, some old paint and an old, an old canvas. And I just started messing with the paint, you know. So I put down the, ba the back colors. And then I, on the original, you can really see it. But the eyes are just like thick, heavy, thick paint. And then I turned the brush around and I started drawing into the paint with the brush, you know, so the paint, so like his hair is the brush, the back of the brush separating the paint, right? Scratching, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was lying around for a long time. And, and uh, to me, it's like, um, <laughs> it's like the expression Jesus might have had when he woke up on Easter Sunday. I went, what the, what happened? You know, what happened? Um, so it's just kind of it's a jokey thing but um so then i called it at the point of resurrection and it's been like like i said laying around i showed it to chris brown who um we were i was he was producing the album you know and uh he he loved it and i said i'd love to do a cover where there's no text just an image you know and i've been told since that it's not a great thing to do because when it's in a shop there's nobody could you have to turn it around to identify it but i don't care so um that's it really that's that's the story so it was a four o'clock in the morning scribble i did two of them this is the one i like the most uh, I love, I'm going to do more like this, actually. More paintings like this. There you go. Yeah, I know. I really like it because it's full of colour and a lot of your other work, yeah. like, you know, is like, and even Amy's one is really, really colourful as well compared to some of the work that I would have known, for instance, with the Hound and stuff, it's very black and white and... Well, the black and white is, um, <laughs> like, pure economy. It's just getting stuff done. Mm. Fast, you know, and the colours is, should look at it's the medium, you know, it's like if you play a song on an acoustic guitar or on a piano, you can play the same song on three instruments and have three different styles. So it's the same, you know. Okay, this is a bit oddball. It's a bit abstract and it's a bit off its head, which I wouldn't normally do. But when I'm painting, I don't like to paint realistic stuff. I can do it, but I, I get bored looking at it because you might as well take a photograph. And I kind of prefer to go after the feeling. With the comics and the illustration and the more graphic stuff, yeah, that's more figurative and that's more, you know, I suppose familiar. Uh, Hound was done digitally, though. That drawing for Amy was done... Japanese ink with a Chinese brush and tracing paper because I was trying you have to do one drawing a day if you want to do this inktober thing so I, I challenged myself to do one a day and they were all kind of different styles it's um kind of cartoony and something very loose just real quick three strokes you know so yeah so it's just all experimenting isn't it it is and it, that's the great thing that you're actually very brave and you do actually experiment a lot like you change it up a lot yeah. um, one of the favorite things that you've done that i've been able to see was that exposition that you did where you did the water fairy artists of all the oh, different yeah. musicians right so i'd yeah. love to talk about that because i completely sure. couldn't last time yeah well that one that was i've done it over the years i mean i haven't done that for imagine in a long time i think that might have been the last thing no no i did something after um the idea for that was, 
uh, well, it was two. It was twofold. One was I want. I get frustrated. First thing that pisses me off. I have to say that. I'm sorry for cursing, but Waterford has an effing gallery. What the f is going on, right? I won't go on a rant about it, but there's no commercial gallery. I was up in Westport for a few days. I was in the north last week for a bit of a holiday. Every fucking village I went into has somewhere somebody can buy a picture drawn by a human being. Now, the municipal gallery is great. Good luck to it. You know, it's all historical paintings that are not for sale. But where can I buy a painting in Waterford? I can't. So I, in 2013, I had this idea, like, how can you, how can I do something that might bring people in who don't normally go to art exhibitions? Because the ones who go will go anyway. So I thought, you know, well, then I, I'm not going to just draw, uh, you know, portraits of, of just my friends or something or famous people. I didn't want to do the old classic, you know, you go up and you start drawing Phil in it or Bono or something. And everybody's at that crack. I thought, no, hang on a minute. There's a lot of really good original musicians around Waterford. And this is before I got back playing music myself. And I knew Paul Butler a little bit. And I knew some of the other guys a little bit. And I just got in touch with them all. And I just said, and at the time, it was all their respective bands. So the idea was that I, I did an ink drawing portrait of everybody. It, it was all in profile for a start. And then I had the ink drawings. And then I went ahead and painted everybody. And I should have just stopped at the ink drawings because the paintings took forever. Nearly killed me. And the ink drawings are better. Uh, the paintings were okay. I sold a few of them to some of the musicians and some other people bought a few, but it wasn't about that. It was, uh, I'd be happy to even give them to the guys now, you know, they're in the back room there. Uh, although the ones who bought them will want to hear that. Sorry, lads. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, or I might paint over them, but the ink drawings, it was a nice exercise because it, it, it was, it wasn't even that I was trying to do an art exhibition. I was trying to do a kind of a get together. And luckily, Ollie and the team in Imagine, they got me that 44, the key, that lovely building there. Jesus, what a great building. And I know that it's owned now by somebody and he's doing art in it every Christmas, which is brilliant. I just, but there's a great venue for a, a permanent gallery cafe, you know, like Green Acres and Wexford. How come Wexford have to say, not against Wexford? I actually used to have an indoor market in there. I used to run an indoor market with a coffee oh. shop in there. It opened Paddy's Day 20, yeah. 2014, maybe. But I'm just surprised how you can go to other towns half the size of this. Like Wexford has Green Acres. It's an amazing place. What a fantastic gallery and restaurant downstairs. And that's, a, that's a bit, I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, I, I did that and about three or 400 people showed up at the opening, which was amazing. And uh, Mick O'Roach and the lads in the Butterfly Band, Madrigal, they actually offered to play. They played a few songs, which was amazing. They just showed up with their gear and uh, Ronan from Keela came down and he sat in with them. Gary Devlin opened it, which was lovely. He came down from Dublin too. And, uh, and it was a really nice, because it was on for a few weeks. And I, I just, that night there was people that I don't think ever went to exhibitions, went in for a look, because it was handy. It was in town. It, was, it wasn't too elite. It wasn't like arty farty where everybody would be afraid to go into a kind of a exhibition. Oh, Jesus, that's, you know, those, this, this idea that like, you know, the working people don't go to art exhibitions or ordinary people go, bullshit, I'm from this dog and I paint for a living. So it's bullshit. But I think the environment, the subject matter, and the fact that all the bands came along and most of them, and uh, it was just fun. It was just a bit of crack. And fair play to, again, to the Monster Express. They they put it on the front cover and, and it was brilliant and they really plugged it. And it, it was an event. That's what it was. And it was nice. And I haven't done anything like it since. And uh, I may do something again, but... It's just uh, life gets in the way. <laughs> well, this moment in time is not ideal to launch an idea like that no, anyway, no, Paul. So. <laughs> even, even releasing this thing, I mean, it's gotten a couple of nice reviews and it's been played off the radio. Uh, it got a few plays here in Ireland, but in America and England and Europe is getting played. And there's a lot of nice reviews coming in from around, around places. But I, I can't, I mean, I can do it. I can sing into my phone like everybody. But, uh, or I can do another one of those live streams with Colin, but uh, it'd be great to do an old gig, but you can't. So I have another album ready, uh, I, I, you know, a second record. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to wait for the virus to let me back on a stage or out. So I'm, I might just put it out later in the year. I, this thing still has a bit of life left in it. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do another video, I think it was, um, well, maybe two. And then, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's just keep pushing. That's all you do. That's all I can do. That's all any of us can do. I'm constantly. All, everybody, yeah, we're all the same. Everybody's just, you know, from the most richest, most famous to somebody who's starting out, everybody's just 
trying to keep it going, you know, especially in art and film and music. It's tough, it's tough, you know. Sure, I'm on 70 interviews now, Paul, out of nowhere, right? And I'm being used like on loads of projects as like someone that people actually want to consult with. Like, mm -hmm. if I thought any of that was going to be happening, like, I'm about to sign my first manager deal as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the up. hell? But you know, like, I mean, there's these kind of times, I think when these things happen, not that something like this has ever happened in my lifetime, but this kind of reset time, when things go and people don't expect it, you know, you can either retreat into the dark and let it consume you, or you can say, no, hang on a minute. This is a chance to refresh or re-whatever, you know. Uh, especially i mean it's different i guess if you have a job where you just show up and you kind of are given a task but if you're doing what i do or what you do or other people who we're kind of in charge of our own you know situation in a way uh for good and bad so yeah it's up to us to make it work and it's um i'm just spinning 10 different plates as i do i have during the lockdown i've done um i finished another comic book i've got two kids books finished um, I'm starting another album. I've, I'm thinking about painting again. This studio is going to be turned back into an art studio because right now it's a bit of a mix of music and art. Um, yeah, so, you know, when it, at the end of the day, I've got to make a living too. So, uh, you know, things have to pay for themselves. And it might be a situation where I disappear again for six months or a year, and that means I'm gone away to work on a movie or something to make some money. Which has to happen as well. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be physically disappear. I'd be able to do it from here, but it just means that I'll have to work on something I probably hate. <laughs> but so what? You know, it is what it is. At least I'm not, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? It, it's At least I'm not unemployed, I suppose, or just completely, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not desperate, but kind of lost, you know? You haven't completely sold out or lost your soul. Well, I, I wouldn't mind. I don't mind selling out. I wouldn't mind selling out the O2. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Fair. Selling out the bullshit. I mean, everybody. Lou Reed, he sold out the day he made a record. Andy Warhol made his painting, made him famous. He sold that painting. He had to, everybody sells out. All I love to talk. I think we all compromise. Do yeah, you know? compromise is fine. You know, there are people I know that make movies that win awards, who do commercials who, under different names. There are professional musicians I know that play in wedding bands because they can't always gig. Well, the same thing. They can't gig anyway now, but. We all do something on the side, but you know, I have a friend who told me one time he was playing the wedding band and uh, he's also in, in a professional band that re releases albums. And he said that when he's doing the weddings, uh, he's practicing his instrument and getting paid for it. So he looks on it in a positive way. He's not saying, oh shit, I'm doing another. Yeah, I, I'm practicing your craft. Thing. Like he's getting paid to play the, the guitar or whatever the hell it is. And so when it, when it, if I have to work on some project to do some drawing or design, I'm getting paid to draw, you know? Yeah. So how bad? It's not that bad. Really. Um, you just reminded me there when you were talking about, I had another interview with this guy called Nathan Mack. He's really interesting. It's a really good interview. But he said in his interview that he makes music for other people. So he doesn't actually make the music that maybe he wants to make, but he makes it for other people because the audience is what is important. Whereas to me, it was like, well, actually it's your music and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. And now my opinion's changing on that the whole time. So I was like, or where do you lie? Is, is, is it a constant well, compromise or? Well, I, I, I wouldn't know how to write a song that people might like. I don't know anything about. Do you know, you just write what you write. You know what I mean? You write what you write. I couldn't sit down and write a song. Like if somebody heard one of, one of my songs and said, we'd love you to write something for Pick a Pop Star, you know, who I couldn't even tell you who's around at the moment, but some, some pop star that's for 12 year old girls. I don't know what the fuck, how would I know how to write a song for that age group, right? or for anything. So I just write on what I like and that. But at the same time, I kind of know, like I write for myself, but I also write for people like myself that have a taste similar to me. Like a lot of the people that responded to my album, that I know anyway, would be people that like used to be, you know, when they were younger, they liked punk and they liked heavy rock and they liked metal and all that. But they've kind of grown up and they don't really like, they like blues and they don't really like corny country music, but they love Towns Van Zandt or, or they like, you know, Johnny Cash and kind of cooler, uh, what they call Americana now, I suppose. And it's rootsier music, you know? And, and, and I think that's just a natural pro progression. It, it's, it's organic music. And, and I think, um, I mean, I like everything. I, I like music played on stringed instruments. I've realized that. I'm not a big fan of electronic music. I like a bit of rap. I like the, not much of it, but I like the older stuff. I like Public Enemy and, and that kind of stuff. I'm not into that bling infested kind of 
look at me and how much I've got mentality. But uh, but it's the same with the heavy rock crowd. They all went up their arse as well in the 80s. And, you know, the likes of your man in Nirvana and the Soundgarden, the guys and all them bringing it back to, you know, something more real. That was brilliant. Um, so it's, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a bit of both. I, I, I never tried to write a song that I could think of as popular. I, I don't, I'd give it a go. I'd probably need help. <laughs> I'd probably have to find somebody to sit with me and say, oh no, you can't really start it like that. You gotta start, like within 30 seconds, you gotta be doing X. But then having said that, the song, um, there's an old classic country structure to songs, which they've been doing since about 1940, which is they start with the chorus, which I think pop music borrowed. And, uh, you know, and I did that on Two Wrongs, the fifth song on that. Um, but it's not a country song, but it's a structure that you're immediately into the song and then you, you know, like you make your statement and then it's all like, here's the answer. Now here's the question. Here's the answer. Here's the, like, it's that kind of conversation. But musically, I suppose it just came out to be rooted in a more rootsy, oh, I don't know what the hell it's like, New Orleans kind of Irish version of, I have no idea. You just, I just do what I do. I mean, the next album is different again. It's like, this is a one particular vibe. The other one was done here in Ireland with different musicians. So that has a different feeling. Yeah, so that was the Canadian one. But then we have the Irish one, which we, last time we talked about it briefly, we weren't really, really sure. And now you're saying you probably will release it regardless of... What's yeah, going on? Will, because, well, it's funny. I think I was telling you last thing that I did it with a friend of mine up in Newry. And, um, but the, it, was, it wasn't even meant to be an album. It was, meant, it was just me putting my toe back in the water. And he was, he's a brilliant guitar player and producer. And, and he could put a great team together. And every time I got a day or he had a day, I would take a spin up and stay overnight. And we'd put down something, you know. And then, um, so it was a kind of over two or three years. Whereas the Canadian thing took about a year, but it was a bit different. It was more... Um, it's, there were just different ways of working, but uh, but the similarity was that we never got to sit down and do it all in one week in one sitting. You know, they, they were both spread. But I was, after finishing the one here in Ireland, which I, Jesus, I think I might have even started messing about in 2016, uh, the first couple of songs. And that EP that I put out in 2018, that was the first result of that. And since then, we've remastered, remixed, and added some extra stuff to those four songs. They will be on that new album. But uh, so in, in, in a way, the Canadian album was recorded second, but put out first when the other one was done first and then we put out second. They kind of overlap. It was just an accident. I, I just happened to have access to the studios and people. I couldn't believe it. So we just did it. And I had all these songs. Um, yeah, so. But like, there's no end to like you like, you're like, oh, there's a thing I could be doing. I probably should do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's like. I, I, I have to, it's raining now, but uh, I tackle anything, you know, I don't care. I, I, one thing I wouldn't tackle is flying an airplane or trying to do surgery. I couldn't really manage those now, but I could probably, you know, <laughs> give landscaping a go or something. <laughs> I reckon you'd be a really good garden designer because that like creative mind of yours, it would have a great idea for color and size and shape. I'm actually helping design a community garden with my son down around the corner, actually. Yeah. It's fascinating. I, I just found out about this community project around the corner and then all of a sudden I became the music coordinator for the launch on Imagine Festival. Funny enough. There you go. Great. Like, it's so much fun designing a garden. Well, I, I, I'm just working out here like we have a bit of space and it's not even that I designed it. I'm just buying stuff when I have, if I have a few 10 quid in my pocket and I happen to be in Woody's or something and I see a plant that's 3 dollars oh, I'll have two of them. And I go home and I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there covered in muck, you know, and I'm going, now I better go write a song. Oh, shit, I've got that painting to finish. Uh, you know, so it's just uh, nothing. But, I mean, sometimes I wish I was a bit more focused, but I kind of enjoy the madness, you know. Yeah, I think it's great, but I'd be the same. I get very bored. Like, if I'm doing the same thing all the time and I have nothing else, I get very bored. I need to be constantly changing what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, I, what I like, I mean, that's my, my anchor, if you want to call it that, is storytelling. So whether I'm doing it with, paintings comics films music there's always a kind of a story attached so whether i use pictures or sound or words i'll even try to write so i was writing i also writing short stories and stuff and just or not even i mean just observations but it's um yeah it's it's good you know like I, i've done i i've finished those couple of books and uh, i started like i have a i have let me see this hound and i i want to do something else with hound now actually i'm thinking about doing the missing years all the stories i couldn't cover so that's that's the next thing I got to look at. So, but there'll be one-off stories that might be like 
collected shorts. Small issues. Because like. it's my version of, of the original Legends, like I did with the other one. But I've, I've done this other comic, uh, which is a weird retelling um, of the Children of Lear. Uh, but it's also do it's done in a, a kind of an oddball way. And it, it was the main characters, I wouldn't say based on, but inspired by the hermit that used to live in the Cummers. So it's 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 uh, set in 1940, and that's a color comic about 40 pages or something. And I've done two kids books, and I have another comic that I'm doing with Ronan from Keela. But a lot of these were started years ago. You know, we we met, we had a chat. We, I found out mutual interests. We, somebody would tell me they had a story, and then you get busy. And now, because of the way I am at the moment, and like everybody, there's a bit of time, you know, um, to to try and finish things. So they're smaller projects. They're they're not big. Things, you know they're but I don't want to publish them I'm trying to find a publisher to take them because it's too much work we, we did hound and 60% of my time was put into just trying to get the book ready you know, so it's a lot of work yeah I'd say it's a lot of work like it is, I... and, and there's no money in it people think you know you, you, you make a fortune off these things like you don't and you know there was an opportunity there recently where somebody offered a friend of mine local businessman uh, loves hound and he offered to uh Put some money into it to help us do a thousand tape thousand copy or yeah like a, a run of a thousand books collected and um we almost did it but uh covid came and that put that to bed and but that was okay because something else has happened since so it's going to be you know things things happen and you just move on from them but i would have been left like if i had taken that that offer which was brilliant uh, and we were delighted it would have meant a thousand books set, sitting here in my studio on a pallet how do i get them at the shops you know how do I get how do, how do I advertise it? Like I don't know if you know, but if you make a film, a feature film, right? And if it costs, um, let's say it costs ten million to make it, or LA style, Hollywood style, hundred million, it costs the same amount again to advertise it. So a film has to make double its budget to make its money back, because press P and A is, and I think with books it's not probably not as much. But if you print, let's say you print a thousand books and it costs you ten thousand euro, right? And you're going to try and sell them then for 30 or 40 each. But by the time you get anything back out of it, you're probably lucky if you broke even because you would want to have another 10,000 to advertise it, to let people know about it, to, to hire somebody like yourself to help us with publicity or to how do you get press ads or all that kind of stuff or, or whatever. You know, so books and music and doing your own stuff, it's, you know, it's tough. But it's, yeah. it's worth it you know, as well. That's the other side. No, it is like, obviously, I had my first first hand experience with GoFundMe recently. Like normally I help other people do their GoFundMe's and it goes a lot smoother. When it was our own baby and we only had six weeks to get it off the ground, it was a lot more difficult. Like it's hard. It's hard work. in the middle of a pandemic, trying to get a crew of 16 people to do Ireland's only music festival as a 10 hour live stream and yeah. put it off. Like I, I, I'm still shaking a bit. Like that was three weeks yeah, ago. It, it, <laughs> but, but, but you got it done, right? Yeah. So now it's behind you. So if you do it again, you'll either decide not to do it that way or you'll find a better way to do it, whatever. I mean, we did the three hound books on Kickstarter because we decided that uh, it was it was a long shot to try and... Like if, if I had it done 20 or 30 pages and, and went to a publisher, we could be waiting a year before they'd even get back to you, you know? So we decided, ah, it, we'll just do it ourselves. So we, we raised the money every every year over three years. Enough money for me to, to not work for a few months to finish the book. And enough money to produce the the books and everything, but luckily the the partner on the project is a guy called Hugh Welshman, who is an English guy, and he has a company in Poland, and they did that loving Vincent, you know the Vincent Van Gogh painted movie. Yeah. Look at that. So that's the, that's the partner on on the Helm project, and him and his wife uh, produced and directed that. And but he had a, a studio in in Gdansk in Poland, and they had some crew, you know, like they had editors and they had different production people. So he was able to like alone hound a few people a couple a few hours a week to help me do the videos and to help us get it out there and manage the website and contact people and put up you know just just do the organization and i had another friend who did a, in america who did a kickstarter and him and his wife did it they made a short movie and i think i i well i, I couldn't comment on what happened in their relationship i think they're still together but he said it was a nightmare you know he they raised a lot of money but when he looked at it and he looked at the effort that was put in and what he got back and then he had to do the bloody film mm. you know it's like me having to do the fucking books you have to do them and you have to get the, you have to get the thing out to the people who backed it 
uh, if it's a book or if it's a it's if it's a character film or whatever, uh, or if it's a kind of an invention, Kickstarter. You know, people use Kickstarter to do product design or whatever. You have to finish that wacky pen. You know, whatever you're designing has to go to the backer. So, like I I heard that there was a story that because um, Kickstarter got very strict about around the time we uh, used them, we didn't want to use GoFundMe or any of those things because. Uh, Kickstarter had a kind of a, a brand to it and it's international and I didn't want to use it just in Ireland because uh, we wouldn't have been able to raise the money because we had 500 backers and I think probably 40 of them was Irish the rest was American and all over the world so it's you know it's that that was good but with the Kickstarter thing I heard there was a fella in America who got it for a book or something a comic and when he got the money he freaked out stressed and he he uh he never delivered. And I don't know is the story that he burnt the books when they came from the printer or he burnt the money. Something crazy. So the people that backed him got nothing. So Kickstarter were very cagey all of a sudden and they, you know, we had to prove, we had to really explain who we were and that we could follow through and we have a track record in other projects and other things. And, you know, you're asking people for money, you know. You have to give them something for it. Yeah, effectively, you're kind of asking people like to crowd, like you are asking people to crowdfund you, but they're yeah. collaborating on your project. Like well, they're the, investing, they're investing. Yeah. You know, if it's a fiver or if it's 500, it doesn't matter. It's still somebody, the person who put in a fiver, it's a lot of effort for that person. It's also a lot more effort, obviously, for 500. But if somebody who's wealthy steps in 500 quid and somebody hasn't got much puts in a fiver, you know, that's the fiver that's for me. You know? So we have to make sure that everybody who put something in got something for that. And if you can't, if you can't deliver, you know, uh, then it's, well, yeah, it's not nice. Yeah, no, I'd say it must be very stressful for bands, for instance, that had a GoFundMe in, in this moment in time and now can't finish their album or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. or, or they can't, they, they, they haven't calculated their budget properly, so they don't have vinyl or CDs or whatever they promised people or T-shirts, you know. Like, we did a lot of T-shirts and I remember at the time I was a bit unsure of them, like, if we should bother and funnily enough, we... Uh, in hindsight, I was right. We didn't sell that many T-shirts. They, they were cool-looking shirts. We sold a few, but and the drawings looked nice on the on the T-shirts. You know, and we we did some nice designs. I think some of them are still on the website. If anybody wants to go, I'll buy a T-shirt actually on helmthemovie.com. If you go okay. to helmthemovie.com, straight after this call, you'll Bob. find all the cool leftover stuff from Kickstarter. But uh, <laughs> but it it really didn't raise what raised money for us on that was interesting. Was uh, people being in the book. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we offered people to, to be uh, characters in, in the book, you know, so we charged, I don't know what, how much it was, but we got a load of people who wanted to uh, be in the book. So the, suddenly you'll notice some of the drawings that kind of look more real than the other character, you know, and that's because that person gave us 200 pounds <laughs> and I put them in the book. So, you know. One day I'll pay you to draw me. I will. Ah, you won't. I will. I'll, I'll, do it. I'll, do it for I'll do it for nothing and surprise you someday and then you'll kill me. Jeez, I'll faint. You'll kill me. I'll actually faint. <laughs> Happy at the end, I'll be like, Oop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I better do a good one then. But obviously I want to talk about film with you in a, in, in a different way. So I told you a story before, but I didn't tell it on camera. When I was a little girl, I was a massive fan of All Dogs Go to Heaven and I was yeah. obviously a massive fan of The Land Before Time. I actually have a cool story around The Land Before Time. Well, I think it's a cool story. When I was eight years old, I had a dream. I wanted a dog. It had to be a Maltese terrier. And it had to be internet called Cleopatra. Is the internet gone? To you. That's okay. The internet is, I, you're, I'm, you're cutting in and out. I think it's my internet. That's okay. We'll try. And if it pauses again, I'll see with the thing. And I'll just um, pause the video. Should be fine. Just, are you okay? All right. Um, so I had this dog called Cleopatra when I was eight years old. And Cleopatra was really... A small Maltese terrier, she was adorable. And I went to McDonald's when The Land Before Time was out, or yeah, was out. And there was that little dinosaur came in the Happy Meal. And Cleopatra oh. took the little dinosaur and used it as her favorite toy and had it everywhere in the house. So we'd watch the film together with my little tiny dog and her little Happy Meal toy. And I'd go, a Waterford man helped make that. Oh, and I'd be, yeah. I'd be in France thinking this was the coolest thing ever. You know, someday, like someone from where I'm from, like did something this cool that I get to watch with my tiny dog. I know it's, uh, well, you know, like that's, 
that was just a big studio opening. And I mean, you can think about all the people that came through that, myself included. There was other guys from Waterford as well, like, around this area, Tremor and Carrington Shore. And, um, and then the Murakami Wolf Studio opened up doing the Ninja Turtles. And my friend Tony Tower, who's just moved back actually, he's also from Ms. Duggan, he's a writer, director in animation. And he's moved, he was in Germany for a long time. And TV. But I, I just got into Blue because I was finished college and I was on the dole, you know, and they were looking for people who could draw. As we finished. Yeah, no, I was, uh, yeah, the whole Blue thing, uh, like I said I, earlier, I, I was in college here. I just finished college and um, myself and a few friends, we, we heard they were looking, they were on TV or something. Uh, and we just heard about it and we applied and we got tests and we got in and, and I was put into what they call rough in betweens, which is basically you do the drawings in between the animators' drawings. So about six months into that, then I they made me a, an assistant animator and I kind of got the hang of how to do it. Um, but the land before time, yeah, that was the first thing and it was amazing because it was um, this huge building up by Phoenix Park and it's 400 people there, I think, and about 100 of them were international, like Americans and Europeans and the rest of were all people from here or living here and uh, there's all kinds of people there people you generally from the age of say 18 up to about 35 maybe that had either were good at art or they were jewelry makers or architects or you know whatever that maybe they want to try something else or they were young like me and um you know i, I was getting paid to, to draw it was crazy and um I, but we we put our head down i i, I remember talking to my friend who's a, a he's from carrick and sure and he's an animator in la now and he's been out there for years. And um, I remember we, I remember saying to him, no matter how good or bad this is, two years is the maximum given this place. Because uh, then there has to be more to this world, you know, if, if it is what it is. And it took me a long time to get my head around the, how, to, how to do that stuff. And, and But then I realized the area I was most interested in. And there was a few training programs that they had. And, you know, you, if you were good at drawing, say, backgrounds or environments, you could lean toward that. Or if, like me, you like drawing characters. It was more animation and then i realized that i like want to do storyboards and all that stuff but you'd never get into that there it was a closed shop so after a couple of years there was a lot of problems too i mean i won't go into it but uh yeah i worked on the old dogs with the heaven then that's when i was and then i spent a little bit of time on the last one for me it was rocket doodle the chicken thing and i left after a couple of months on that and i went to germany and then i went to england to richard williams and i think i told you before and i came back and all that but the, the blue thing, yeah, and I remember I, I, I had seen all the different cuts, you know, of Land Before Time. You, you watch it every week as it's being made and it's been put together. And uh, there were some great sequences that were toned down or taken out or whatever. And then I got to see it when it was released in Germany. I didn't, I didn't see it in English at first. I saw it in German. I remember sitting in the cinema. and um, But because I knew it so well, I could understand it. My German is my German, still not great. I can understand it a bit, but can't really speak it but uh at that time i hadn't a clue and i was watching it in berlin <laughs> in german <laughs> the, the cinema you know he's been little foot or or claim or whatever the hell name they gave him you know and i was like i don't, know. Fuss? I don't know i just <laughs> I would, yeah kleiner fuss, would be, fuss but, yeah. mm -hmm. but he was called thunderfoot at the start oh and they changed it to littlefoot because they thought it was too scary for kids to be called thunderfoot whatever so uh I saw yeah. it in French. I can't remember what his name is in French. And the dinosaur I had, her name in French was Betty, but in English that, that isn't ducky. really. Is that the little ducky character? Yeah. Yeah, there's a very, very sad story about that kid. Oh. The actress, do you know about this? No. Oh, it's horrible. I mean, I shouldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> she was the little girl in All Dogs Go to Heaven as well. Oh. And she was in, the only live action film she's in, that you can see her, is Jaws 3, I think. Spielberg liked her and he used her in Land Before Time and then he used her in Jaws. She's only about nine or ten. She was killed by her father. He shot himself, he shot her and the mother and himself. And Don Bluth got us all together in the building. Uh, I remember standing there and he said, like, some bad news. Uh, I can't remember her name, but Anne Marie was the character and he said, She's she's no, she's dead. And uh, we, we, we didn't get all the lines, I think he said, and we were going to have to reconstruct some outtakes, you know, change some of the script. He said, but uh, the little girl has just died, you know, it was mad. So the father lost his mind that he killed the whole family. It was terrible. That was in 89, 88, 89. 
Yeah, so that you can imagine the cloud over a happy cartoon for kids, that bloody thing hanging over it. But the poor little kid, yeah, she was she was killed. Very, very sad. And um yeah, but it was you know, they were interesting for me because I saw that as a I was really interested in learning how to do this as a thing, you know. And I was a kind of put in a position like usually you were you were in a team and then you would work on a lot of different stuff done by a lot of different people. And some people then were taken out of those teams and paired off with animators and whatever. Uh, and I was kind of uh, spread between a few different people, excuse me. So I, I learned a lot. I, I worked with a lot of different of the top animators watching how they did stuff and they would leave things out for me to try things. And, and you know, each of them had different techniques. And a lot of these people had worked on the, the in Disney in the late in the 70s so uh so there was a lot of experience in that room and it was a direct connect back to the old movies which was really interesting because they had, they would have learned like me that i was learning there they would have gone through the same thing with the guys who animated jungle book and all that so i i was one person removed from learning those skills which was pretty impressive and when i look back you know we did we did cop onto it pr pretty quick now when everything changed when cg came in and it was a whole different um toolbox that you're working with animation hasn't changed but um it's not about the drawing anymore you know it's more about the performance it's a different it, in the 2d world back in those days you had to be able to draw and perform now you're manipulating a uh, a virtual puppet so you're doing more like a stop motion stroke live action approach to animation it's more about how they move because it, it always looks the same the big problem in those days was everybody had to draw the character the same you know and it's not very easy to do that so you would have different, like they figured out a system in Disney, which was interesting on Tarzan, I think, and even before that, where they would give a certain animator a certain character and that, and that animator might have a team of four or five animators. So like say Tarzan, the main character, Glenn Keane did him and then another a guy that I worked with in Blue did Jane. So Ken Duncan had um, Jane and he would work out how she would perform all her acting and all that and how she would move. And then he would have five maybe or six animators that he would do the close-ups and the really difficult stuff and another guy would do all where she's running or she's far away but he had to make her always look like jane so you could have like in a in a lower budget film it, and it still is the case that you could have 20 animators all working on the one character which means they all make a move slightly different so that's that's really hard to control you know and that's a skill that you have to learn when you make those movies and even in cg it's the same you know because somebody's walking and suddenly then one person starts to make his head bob no no he doesn't bob his head well i like doing bobbing heads anyway this guy doesn't do that he walks with a hump back oh, i don't like that you know whatever so it's a it's a whole skill in itself it's not just about drawing and it's not just about that it was you know it's really complex i hadn't thought about that i had a puppeteer on before and he explained that it can take up to 150 people to make a puppet right i thought about that i kind of that was natural to me but but in fact to make it perform right yeah, I know. Whereas in animation, like if you if you're animating Batman or, or, or you know, take the dinosaur and Thunderfoot or Littlefoot, whatever he was called, like you could have had twenty animators an animating him, but there'd be three or four lead animators who would do, because they really had him nailed, so they would know how to make him act, cry, whatever. So if you had him in the distance walking up up a mountainside, nobody got too picky about that, but they got picky about how he would react or talk to the other characters, you know. So how he turned his head when he laughed or how far up would his cheek go or um, how would he use his paws, you know, like in Land Before Time, they didn't really do Tom and Jerry. They weren't doing these gestures. They were real animals, you know, uh, walking like on their four legs. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that has to be agreed at the start of a project about how characters will move and blah, 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 you know. And everybody has to buy into it or you're going to have a hard time. It's like making an album, you know. If you go in to make a blues album or something, or a particular or a dance album, and some guy wants to play heavy metal, you know what are you doing? This is we're not doing that kind of music. But I love playing that kind of stuff. Well, you're in the wrong bloody band, you know. So it's the same in in certain kinds of movies. There's a lot of times in films, they people are just looking for a job, which is fine, and then they come in, they're not suited to the particular film, personality wise or skill wise, and it can cause a lot of a lot of problems. You're, sometimes you're stuck with them, you know. You, you can't get rid of them. Because you've nobody else. 
Yeah, and you we really do need to gel as a team to make something. Do, and and you know, I I find I mean I always find it kind of tough because I expect people to be adults when they get paid for a job, and I expect them to do that bloody work. And then you start getting the prima donnas or the immature or the oversensitive, and you're going, oh, you know, if you want to paint and have an exhibition, go home and do it. In here, you're you have to your part is this small in a big line of things. It has to fit. Some people don't see it like that. So it's it's a pure it's a ma- I mean it is animation is a it's an interesting world, you know. Um there's a very commercial side to it, there's also a very artistic side to it. Um yeah. I'm I'm kind of I wouldn't say I'm done with it, but I'm I'm not as in it as I used to be. Uh, I'm still we're developing th- two or three features at the moment, but I'm more of a producer on those and and I might end up designing them or something, but I won't be hands-on on every little element. You know, like even that river dance thing I did, I wasn't responsible for financing that. I wasn't responsible for hiring people. I wasn't responsible for running the studio or directing the movie. I was just there to design it. Now, every decision I made is going to cost money for somebody because if I decide to make the forest a particular way, somebody's going to go, oh, you want to do that? You know, it was it's a constant trade-off you're, you're constantly saying well if i want the water to look this realistic then the rocks have to look plastic <laughs> or something you know it's, you're always trading on always compromising and unless you have a huge budget and even then you're you're compromising but uh, and a lot of people who get into it or are new to it and i think it's the same at music people who are great at playing in pubs are brilliant at doing cover versions and can play any song but like i can't play cover versions i feel i can do a few but i wouldn't have a clue you know I've only done me also, but I know players who are brilliant at playing. You could name a song and they they hear it and they could play it, but they can't write the music. They can't write a song. They've never sat down, or they don't have the confidence. So you go into a studio with them, and as soon as the red light comes on, they melt. But in a in a live situation, playing their favorite songs, they're amazing. So it's it's very different. Everything's kind of, you know, everything's got its own, um, not rules, but. Um, like everyone has their own skill sets almost like everyone has yeah, a different and then each different thing has its own context i suppose like you know if, if you're in a wedding band and there's no point in playing first sight of black sabbath you know creative purpose like yeah yeah you know you're there to entertain people and it has a particular context and it's it's not meant to be for your benefit it's meant to be for the they're asking you what songs to play but if you're playing your own gig and people are coming along to see you play your music you know most most of the time They'll forgive you if you mess around a bit or if you're trying out stuff. Or, like the original audience is a bit different than a ba- a people out for the, on the last who want to hear their favorite song. Of course. Unless you're a big star and then you're a slave to your fa- you're a big hit because you have to play it for 30 years. Do you know what? I wouldn't mind having a big hit and playing it for 30 years. If, you know? I feel, I feel conflicted about that, right? Because that must really get really, really fucking annoying, really yeah, fucking yeah, fast, yeah, right? Ozzy Osbourne must hate Paranoid. You know, or take any band, I don't know. I mean, Kurt Cobain never had this. He wasn't alive long enough to sing that one. So, but his big hit. But, you know, bands from, like Cliff Richard was to be singing his fucking song since the 50s. And then he's still at, you know what I mean? Like, man must be in his 80s if he's still alive. I don't know. But, but yeah, it must get frustrating. But, you know, at some point, like bands, a lot of older bands have come back, the greatest hits tours and all that, because lifestyles have to be maintained or college fees have to be paid or bread has to be bought. I don't know life kicks in you know it's great to be thinking oh i'm going to be different every album i'm going to explore i mean i kind of have a weird luxury with the two things i've done and i just did them the way i want but i don't know how you know i I, i'd love to see them start paying some of the bills but uh who knows but it's it's uh (laughs) it's um they were they're like um i treat that those two records i i'm doing as almost like art projects They're, it's me trying out stuff but the songwriting is quite conventional I, i'm not i'm i'm de- deliberately not trying to experiment i'm trying to work within a recognized framework you know because i could go off and faff around on the computer and come up with all kinds of beats man you know and start doing all those crazy symbols and you might be in that eventually though paul don't knock it because you haven't tried it yet and you're very oh. creative so anything could happen yeah. I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen. But, but my, my stepson is brilliant at it, Fritz. Uh, he's, he grew up here in Mountain. He's from Berlin. And if uh, anybody's interested in a, a new singer who's uh, mixing rock and, and kind of, I suppose, 
I don't know if it's hip hop, but he's really fucking good. He's in Berlin now. Fritz Hazy, you should look him up. I will actually send him my way. He might do an interview from Berlin. Berlin. I could use a German interview, yeah. He'd be delighted with his. Uh, well, he's he sounds fairly Waterford now, fair. Nice. <laughs> but he um he came over here when he was ten, and he was always interested in a bit of music, and then he started jamming around. But he went back to Germany after the leaving cert, so he was living here for ten years, and he went back, and now he's uh he's doing great over there. He's um he's got a mate who uh, is a brilliant musician. They were on, they've been on TV, they've done loads of stuff over there. They're, they're really good actually yeah and you know he's he's dabbling with like mixing the genres he he likes which is i guess leading towards the hip-hop but he also has that slight rock acoustic vibe going on so it's kind of cool but um yeah but you know it's 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 not it's not even it's not to do with age i mean she's the beastie boys are my age you know what i mean they were doing rap you know it's not that i'm i'm not against that but it's just i feel comfortable in an organic sound you know but i work digitally doing the artwork but i also can work on canvas you know but having said that yeah you know maybe there is a song out there that you could take and and work with a producer who knows how to to do you know not have real musicians there as such or a band and give it a certain vibe i'm always open to stuff but i i wouldn't set out to do that because i think i just sound like pastiche i think i would just sound like i'm trying to do it okay Mm. Yeah, so unless something actually niggles at you and there's really a creative yeah, like reason a, for it. Yeah, I mean, I have messed around here. I, I When I'm writing, I'm doing acoustic guitar to a drum machine and I do mess about a bit. Uh, but it, it can sound a bit contrived because the overlying melody or, or the theme of the song or something that's gone on is really pushing towards a different... Um, it's like a square peg in a round hole. I think you have to be careful of that. I mean, they can work. Hybrids can work brilliantly, but sometimes they can sound a bit naff too, you know? Yeah, no, you're right. So yeah. I suppose it's experimentation, but it's um, I have a certain way of singing that I like singing, and um, yeah, I'm I think I'm going to continue with that for now. <laughs> Do it. We'll see. We'll see. Like in ten years' time, when we're interviewing again, and you're like, well, actually, Rebecca, I learned how to use Ableton, and now. <laughs> yeah, I have a baseball cap on backwards. Right? Fuck. Who even knows what the world is going to be like? <laughs> Who knows, but a lot of people are upskilling in this moment in time. A lot of people are learning new things. That reminds me of how you got into animation, actually, because in my in the back of my brain, I was like, this is actually the perfect moment in time for anyone who's considering changing their job to actually upskill and try something else. And then when all I, this is over. I was, I was at dinner last night with friends of mine. And, um, you know, he, this guy has been at what he's been at for years and years. He's brilliant at it. And he's talking about changing. You know, and I mean, I'm... I'm not changing what I do in terms of um, coming up with stuff, or, but I, 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 I can feel myself mo- moving more towards doing my own stuff or, or maybe doing um, illustration more. Or j- I, I think with animation, you have to give over yourself over to the fact that you're, uh, you're a soldier in an army. You know, you're one of many in a, in a bigger picture. And if it's certainly, if it's a TV show or a feature film, if, if it's your own movie, yeah, okay, you can make that with your friends, but... If, if you're going to work on a feature film or you're going to work on a long-running TV show, there's going to be a few hundred people involved. So you're just one of many. Now, it's, that's not to diminish what people's tasks are. They're very important. But uh, you are a very big team player, in, like working in a factory almost. And your job is crucial on that line, you know. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in the architecture of projects now, in coming up with them and designing them and trying to get them off the ground. I'll still do the day-to-day service stuff if I have to live, but it's it's uh, i suppose at this stage and any of the lads that i know or people i know around my age who've been at this now for a while i think it might be an age thing we you know animation is very much a, a kind of a young person's game it's um you know and also the kind of animation they're making now i don't really want to do anyway i don't want to do preschool animation you know i don't have young kids uh, I, I have no interest in making educational programs i want to make entertainment with fun and crack and a lot of the younger, a lot of the shows that are made in Ireland are leaning towards a kind of, um, their edutainment. Is that a hard word? I, I don't even know if they are, Paul, because a lot of the garbage out there available for my son is like, it's not even educational. Like, I don't even know what it's trying to be, to be honest. Yeah, like, they don't either, but that's what they'll tell you. And the, <sighs> the problem is when you work in it, uh, for me anyway, is that there's almost like a committee supervising every aspect. So whereas it used to be before, everything was solved at the script stage by the network or the producers and the writers, you know, 
they would decide and they would like oh, that's a bit much let's not put that in like oh no psychologists have to look at it now and it has to go before this and that and we don't you know we, we can't surprise kids because they're not able to i mean i don't know what kind of kids that they're creating but or what they think they're creating well like i i'm i grew up in a very kind of I want it's kind of unusual way actually I would say my parents never censored anything from me we had age appropriate conversations about everything that I watched do you know we were the same but I mean I, I remember reading an interview with Chuck Jones who did all the Bugs Bunny stuff in the 50s and he he met some people in the 70s I think or maybe in the 60s no it was in the 70s or 80s and all the kids that were watching Bugs Bunny and all that stuff in the early 50s and all that anarchic kind of um, Sylvester the Cat and Tweety, the, you know, all that Speedy Gonzalez and all that mad stuff, which some countries don't like now because they see it as violent, which is ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, they said, you know, you created the 60s. I said, what do you mean? Well, you gave us free thought. I mean, all those cartoons were amazing. So they were all little 10 year olds who, by the 1966, were the Beach Boys and all the bands that we all love, Jefferson Airplane. And, all the guys Woodstock generation who created the music that became then the next crowd, you know, it fed into the next, next, next. So Chuck Jones, by having a generation of young American kids watching these mad cartoons, you know, saw the value in lunacy and having fun and open mindedness and except imagination, the imagination. Yeah. And you know, uh, no, there was a, there was some of those cartoons that can be kind of racist and can be whatever, but, but not by the fifties, but I think by the early fifties, they were getting to be more fun oriented. Certainly in the 40s, there's a few questions about ones, but I, but you know, there's a bit of truth to that. And then we grew up on the 70s ones, my age group, say Scooby Doo and the Pink Panther, which were slightly more sarcastic and cool, you know, in, in their own way. Those, and then we would see the older stuff, the Flintstones, for example, in the 60s are brilliant. Uh, they're all based on old comedy shows. And then by the 80s, so I was too old. And then uh, I was already getting involved in that business. And then it was more about selling toys then the Transformers came out and all that to carry on the Battle of the Planets. So in the last 20 odd years, I suppose, the preschool thing has really taken off, you know, and it's become a, a massive industry. So a lot of the studios, particularly in Ireland, they lean towards that uh, because it's, it's, it's good work, you know, it's good money and it's, it's great. You know, people can learn how to make films and get paid for it. You know, and studios can have great businesses doing that stuff. It's true. Not wrong with that. It's just not not really for me anymore. And it is kind of robbing our kids from imagination, really. Like, well, like our... what it does is, from for me, what it does is, yeah, it is that, and it also it takes out the element of surprise. I remember one note I got on something I was working on something for somebody, and it's all about how you film the scene. You know, there was two characters going to jump out on um, another character and boo, you know, say boo to him. But normally you would film it from the point of view of the two that were setting up the joke, you know. And the character that was going to get spooked would would get a fright when they jumped out because they'd be laughing behind the wall. And then they said, "Oh, you gotta, you've got to film it from the person who's going to be spooked point of view." And he has to see their foot or something because we can't have surprises. Kids don't can't get spooked, you know, right? Wow. Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. I had a really interesting conversation with a friend of mine and it's about how I raised my son yesterday, right? And one of the things he was saying is he was like, I think it was Nikola Tesla. Um, his mom used to make him practice everything in his dreamscape. So the understanding is that his mom used to make him use his dreamscape when he was asleep to try and up his brain skills, okay? And um, always use the imagination. And my friend is a barber and he started doing this kind of test with the kids that were coming in to his barber shop, asking them, what did you dream about? Or do you remember dreaming? Cause he was remembering when he was a kid, he was playing tag. He'd go home and he'd have dreams about the girl he was playing tag with that day or just dreams from having played. But most of these kids were just playing video games or watching TV. Mm. They weren't having dreams. Mm. And I was like, that's mad because every night before I go to bed, I ask my son, what are we going to dream about? And yeah. every morning when we wake up, the first thing we talk about is the dreams we had the night before. Yeah, because it's all, the, not all, but a lot of the kids are reactive now. They're not proactive. You know, they're reacting to stuff. And I think it's gone a bit the same with art and music and film. There's a sort of a reactive, it's a passive uh, engagement. It's not like, um, I remember when I went to see Star Wars when it came out the first time. And, you know, I mean, kids are still looking obviously forward to the new Star Wars and they love it and everything. 
and uh, maybe that's a bad example, but it's the kind of thing where you're just this video game thing, or, or you know, it's. I suppose uh, the thing that strikes me is I remember when I was about fifteen, we heard about blues music, or we heard about certain things that were, you know, the fifties, for example. It was would have been our parents' music or our grandparents' music, and but we we sought it out because one of our favorite musicians said he listened to Chuck Berry or something. So who's Chuck Berry? And I just wonder, our kids now. Everything that's older than five years seems to be dinosaurs. Like it's ancient. We don't want to know about. It. And this is, feels to me with, with some people that it's like you know, I, like people in the know are always going to be in the know. Uh, no matter what age you are, you'll always seek. There's always seekers. But in general, there's a kind of a thing where I'll just take what I'm given. What's in front of me. There's nothing behind it. You know, I'm not going to look. And that's that's what I kind of worry about because that then you can get people to think whatever way you want them to think. Look at America at the moment. You know, you can you can transform how a, half a country thinks by, uh, you know, belittling and and I I have this theory about uh, maybe I read it somewhere, but Friends was the start of the the, the first attack on intellectualism. Absolutely. Because Ross, the character Ross, I don't know much about Friends, but I remember reading this thing where Ross is a paleontologist who's the most stupidest guy in the room. Wow. And you know what? Friends was also the first, in my opinion, attack on the family unit. Like none of them actually really care about kids until seasons are much later. Having a family unit is weird. Like why would your friends have children, stuff like that? So it was kind of making people feel like they should be single and mingling forever, kind of yeah, breaking down like society. It's like, like. It's like teenagers forever, you know? Um, yeah. But it, it struck me like Joey was, was kind of thick, but he was you know, funny and, and witty and, and idiotic and he was like your dopey cousin or brother. But the guy who was the brain box in the room was always belittled. You know, and it's a cultural attack on like you have to be looking a certain way or speaking a certain way or you have to be a certain whatever. And that's acceptable. And you know, on all the different levels that they can do that. Um that's why, you know, the, but there's always gonna be good music or there's honestly good good is subjective, but there's always gonna be music or books or whatever that will will do their thing you know and, and the people will, will will find them but in general like I, I i have a friend who can't listen to music before like they like kind of you know this disco dancey poppy stuff and i think it must be a frequency their ears train to a particular sound it's not even that like the only old music that they would even contemplate and by what i mean by old is something from the 60s or 70s is soul music because it has a certain vibe to it but the minute you put on a blues well i can't listen to that or traditional music, oh, it's horrible. So they, they're after being conditioned to listen to a particular thing or a particular movie or a particular style of something. And so there's not a lot of room for, for other stuff. You know, it's very narrow now. But that's funny because, you know, diff music can be used in different ways. Like, so like music was used for torture to some people. So obviously this person's affected that way. I had this really weird thing done to me when I was younger because I was dyslexic and I grew up in Switzerland. They basically tried to retrain my brain with classical music mm. in it. And they, they had headphones like this on me and they had like these little um, things up here. It turns out it's exactly what they do with the Israeli snipers. Um, <laughs> they use like, um, yeah, they send signals to your brain to try and kind of recondition you. They put you in this little boot like a like a recording boot and they make you read for an hour while they're putting classical music in there to try and open your brain waves to retrain the dyslexia out of you and did it work i'm definitely very intelligent paul uh, i don't know if i could be a good sniper i'm definitely still dyslexic no but dyslexia is not a sign of it's not to do with your intelligence i mean but it was such a weird thing. I was like, so they're using this on Israeli like snipers as well. And then you've China using it to torture people. And then you have your friends who listen, cannot listen because their brain is not able for certain. Mad. Uh, I, I remember working with Richard Williams who did Roger Rabbit. Uh, and he was telling us the story. He used Because people in the studios in animation, used to, they probably still do, but they have the headphones in and they're working in their own world. And and nowadays they're open plan studios, which I don't really like. But back in those days, well, that was open plan actually. But some of them, they used to have cubicles or you'd be in a couple of people in, in a room. But I remember he was complaining about some scene or some shot that he didn't like. And he was saying, uh, you know, he, I remember on a, on a commercial one time, um, 
than when listening to the headphones. I don't know what he was working on back in the 80s or well. And he said that, uh, how can you animate Mozart if you're listening to the Rolling Stones? <laughs> he just reminded me of it because there's some guy listening to punk or whatever, but he has to animate this lyrical, beautiful thing, you know? And inside his head, and he's going against, but he's able to do it. But because one person had this idea that you must be, if, if you're going to animate grass flowing in the wind, the music must sound like that. Well, not necessarily. You know? but I, 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 I wouldn't agree with that. I could see how it could work, though. Like, inspirationally, you would need the flow yeah, to be a certain I mean, way, but maybe your creative flow doesn't always have to correspond to what you're listening to. Well, it doesn't. I mean, not for me, anyway. I mean, I, I can sit here and put on the fastest, heaviest nonsense that I could find when I'm drawing a, a children's book, or I can put on the quietest thing in the world if I'm drawing Helm, you know? It's, a, it's, what, it's the mood, you know? Yeah, so it, that's a great question I've never thought about asking you. So, like, musically, while you're creating other pieces that are not music, how is it just the mood that lets you decide? I, I only put on music when I'm drawing. I, I, not when I'm writing, it's silence, because I can't. I, do, I start to write what they're singing. <laughs> I start writing down the lyrics, you know. I start going along with the song. It's really stupid. But if I'm drawing or when I'm in an autopilot moment, I've done the script, I've done the thumbnails, or I've done the, the rough drawing, and I want to make it final, then I can put on a record and just have it in the background when I'm finishing it off but when I'm coming up with it I like silence that's amazing my dad only ever listens to music anymore when he's reading so he always listens to that because that, they clash for me because I have I to one or the other he listens like he listens to Enya and Clannage whenever he's actually reading his fantasy books what? all the time all the well, time. I, I remember I was in a band up in New Ross when I was a kid. We had a metal band here in town and we used to go up to stay with the lads in Ross. Half the band was from New Ross and the other half was from here. And um, the guy that used to be our manager, stroke road manager, whatever, our, our, he was the guy that actually started the band. We'd stay up in his house, but he put on music. I've never experienced people going to sleep to music. And I, I still can't sleep with sound. And it was in the room, like four or five of us, you know, we'd be on sleeping bags or whatever. And he'd put on. Uh, an album kind of low in the background and it would drive me like crazy but it's just you know everybody has a different thing everybody just has different things they get used to you know? my son goes to sleep to meditation music like he goes to sleep to uh healing sound chambers it helps him just knock off whereas i couldn't no so way he goes up, he's going to be going to sleep to sound garden or something do you know what that child have incredible taste in music already so no fear he'd prefer to listen to music for instance than watch brainwashing tv He'd prefer to be out in nature rather, and, and using his imagination rather than just like, he's amazing. I think more kids should be like him. He's, yeah. he's wild. He drives the school insane. I'm really worried about him going back in a few weeks time, but he's amazing. <laughs> well, well, did you hear on the news today, they've had a huge outbreak in Berlin school. Yeah, it's not good. I'm not worried about the outbreak because I don't think my child is susceptible to be really sick, but I am worried about him being conditioned to believing it's not okay to touch other people and that he has to be distant to people yeah, because that's the sort of stuff that will stay in your brain forever. Yeah. That other stuff will stay in your lungs forever though if you get it. Yeah. It's just, in kids it doesn't seem to be that strong. That's what I mean. Like, I, I'm not going to have him around old people. I'm not, like, we still stay in the house just the two of us all the time. You know? See how it goes, but, you know, kids, I've, the two kids here always came home from school and made us all sick. No, that they are. They're little. They're germ factories, like. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's who knows, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's because we were supposed to have a bit of a party here tomorrow for friends and family, but I cancel it. Just can't do it. No. Yeah, no, because everything's after changing again. Like nothing. Yeah, and it'll probably change again. You know, and I think it's a case of just uh, you're better off be safe than sorry, no matter what you think. Beliefs. I have no interest in beliefs. So I I go for facts every time. I'm not a person that follows emotion. I, I want facts. And I, the, the fact is, a few of my friends' parents have died from this bloody thing, and they're not lying. Of course. Of course. So out there. And, you know, and like, it's, people can believe what they want, but I often hear people saying, oh, this is, you know, this is not really a reality. So I step off Reginald's tower and I'll come back to it. It's fucking real, you know? Look, like, I'm not saying it's not at any point. I'm just genuinely concerned about having a four-year-old conditioned to believing that it's not okay to touch people. But you know what, though? Uh, that money lasts for six months, and then your four-year-old will be six. I brought two German kids over here who were eight and ten who couldn't speak the language. <laughs> and, and, and within a summer, they were like Irish kids, and they're doing grand now. 
kids are amazing beasts you know they they, they can't, adults that can't adapt children are fine children always come out and stuff so yeah okay your kid might your little fella might not be able to do what you like him doing for a few months because of this horrible thing but i guarantee you by the age of six or seven like hopefully it's all gone he'll be back on form or you'll see him doing what what you want him to do i, I just think it's we have to be careful with that thing you know and and i think it's uh yeah i mean History doesn't repeat itself, but it likes to rhyme. You know, it's the lyric I put in the songs. I think I stole it from somebody else. We we, we won't repeat what happened with the Spanish flu, you know, because we live in a different world. But um, that thing killed more people than the world than the war just before. It. I know, and, it, and was, it was when everyone met in the streets again after the war ended that the worst outbreak actually happened because yeah, they were finally celebrating. It, it was in the second wave because they met. The war ended, they went out in the streets, had a party, and then they were told to not do that again, and they did it again. And then that's when it all kicked out, went crazy. And, and the war itself is what even kicked off the, the pandemic in the first place, because this guy came over from America with something that they never had, and then bam! like. Well, it's like syphilis in the Middle Ages. <laughs> they managed to destroy the Aztecs mm. and brought that back. That's the, true. You know, the, the poor Aztecs are destroyed, but they gave a nice present to their destroyers, you know? So it's... Um, yeah it's it's mad stuff and you just have to be careful you know and i mean yeah you you could i mean i i kind of my attitude is i i live every day like it's the last anyway but uh i try to pack in the stuff i want to do like i'm gonna have to do all the stuff when we finish but it's and some of it can be the most mundane or it could be the most creative but it's um yeah people seem to think they're gonna live forever you know they're gonna be well forever <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like it's mad I actually, do you know what? Yesterday was a really, really strange day. These born again Christians came up to me and we had a very, very beautiful debate. Um, it was going really well. Like I'm pretty versed on theology. I can have a very open minded conversation with pretty much anyone. Uh, but one of them asked me directly, like, did I want to go to heaven? And I was like, I'll be perfectly honest with you, buddy. If it gets better than where I am right now, I'd be amazed. Like, yeah. Well, I, I would ask them to, to define heaven. Yeah. He was like, you mean what you're living right now is heaven? I was like, yeah, every day I am blessed beyond belief because of my approach to how I live is just to be happy and yeah, blessed. Yeah, but you know, the, those people and people like them who are, don't want to be in this world should just go to the one they want to be in and leave. I'm happy with this shithole. I'm quite happy with the earth. Happy with the people I know. And if they don't want to be here, see ya. But then they'll say, we, we, we can't do that because we you know that's not our way in a way into what and then they, they say stuff like uh the thing that may happen <laughs> and then they they say stuff like you know i'm going to be back with my family and whoever and i said jesus christ there's some people in my family i never want to see again <laughs> and, or, or else I, i'm going to be with my mother and then yeah but who does your mother want to be with because you want to be with that old lady that died or that person that died of a certain age but maybe she wants to be with her mother but my dog cleopatra is up there waiting for me though yeah, so well, at what age as the Pope, as the way it was when it died. Yeah, that's true. Sure. And what age will you be? Will they recognize you when you go there? Because you might die at 79 or 100, probably. You won't look like you do, like when the dog died. So does that mean every... So it's a, it's a very big question that they can't answer because it's a nonsense. I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, you do what you can for here, for people, I think, when we're here with them. Uh, just don't be a git. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, one of the guys got in big trouble with me and then moments later got in big trouble for screaming at these, these, these really nice couple of women that were holding hands in town what he said to me though right was you're saying here that you wouldn't enjoy being in heaven i was like i didn't say that he's like you're very close-minded i was like i'm not close-minded and then he went when we get to heaven you'll be on your face in front of jesus because you'll be so grateful and i went i will be doing no such thing i was like if jesus the Jesus that I have in my head would not want me on my face or on my knees in front of him. He would want me on the same level as him because we're all one, right? And he was like, all you women hate being told you'd be on your face for him. And I went, whoa, I'm sorry. I'm Eve. I'm the reason for the apple. All sin is my fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. And who wrote the fucking story? Man. That is exactly a brilliant point. And then we were asking about the babies being bashed on rocks and they said, it is a historical account of what happened at the time, not how Jesus wanted us to live. That's right, yeah. But Jesus also said, slaves obey your masters. Yeah. There's loads of things. So, it was okay you know, to beat women, you know? Is, that whole thing is, is only in the world because the Roman emperor wanted to survive. You know? I mean, it's historical, whether they like it or not. The fact is in the third or fourth century or fifth century, 
Constantine was under attack and he needed an army and that cult was the biggest cult in town and they were happy to die for their die on their you know and it became a political force you know and then he gave them the Vatican Hill and they built that through indulgences it's a horrible history and you know it's very sinister but we won't get into that I'm not going to bash it all because I could interview number three maybe <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to be a professional religion basher <laughs> it's an irrelevance to me the whole thing you know it's uh i mean i do have a bit of fun sometimes on twitter there'll be a funny comment made and i'll just go back and poke but sometimes you just have to sometimes you just gotta walk there is a very good saying in the bible i can't remember it exactly but i do like that uh there are some doors you know they used to do that thing where they would take their shoes off when they walked inside and you lay your sandals at the door but there are some doors that you can't lay your sandals i can't remember the quote exactly but it's not worth your while entering that house you know these two men kept coming up to me because of my clothes and hair i think so yeah Yeah. i don't know i I just think there's an epidemic of idiocy at the moment definitely and fear and all the rest of it and and you know people are just terrified and maybe idiocy idiocy is not a fair word maybe it's just fear and 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 lack of education and some of these people are very intelligent they're not stupid they just lack uh, facts don't seem to matter. Ignorance and wherewithal, like it's all missing. Like one of my reasons for not taking the pamphlet wasn't even that I didn't want to read about the Lord's word. It was because it hurt me that they had destroyed that many trees to give me a message I could find online. Well, they don't you know? care because they were given dominion over the earth. They can do what they want to. What they want to. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you could go on about it forever. And it doesn't, it's not just Christianity. It's, it's pretty much all of them, you know, that they all have something to answer for. Even, even the nice ones, they, they suck facts and you know in the like what's that thing you're not entitled to your own facts because an american politician said that they said entitled to your own feelings but you're not entitled to your own facts and i like that that's that's maybe the end that's an end my third album (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah so that yeah it's so is there anything else you wanted to no i was about to ask you is there anything else you want to talk about because i actually have a business call in a minute and you also have a very busy day (laughs) okay I've, I've got to go out and uh, I'm going to plaster a wall now. And I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to learn. But there is no end to your talents, like. No, there's not. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's no end to friends who put up with my bullshit. I went to a friend and borrowed all this building crap off him and I'm going out there now to make a show of myself in the yard. So. But I'm going to go. I recently had a, a friend of mine move in for like a few weeks and he fixed up my whole entire house. Oh yeah, you told me that, yeah. Very it's good. amazing. It's amazing. I'm not that good now. I, I can, I'm going to be able to do that. Maybe you should see if he'll move in with you. He'll just do it all for you. <laughs> Maybe I'll get his number if you get a few things done. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful evening. No problem. See you. Bye.